Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. My name is Miranda Peterson, and I will be presenting today along with my colleague, Rachel Madelson. First, I would like to highlight a few recent statistics in order to better contextualize the problem of sexual assault in the United States military. These numbers are derived from the Department of Defense's annual report, which is released by the Sexual Assault Prevention and Response Office. <clears throat> Between 2011 and 2012, estimated incidents of unwanted sexual contact increased from 19,300 to over 26,000. Only 3,374 victims reported these attacks and less than 10% of service members made an unrestricted report of their assaults. Victims of rape and sexual assault in the military have two reporting options, restricted and unrestricted. Restricted reporting allows victims to access emergency medical and counseling services without triggering an investigation into the assault. Unrestricted reports trigger an open investigation and result in immediate command notification. The severe underreporting of this crime, along with the fact that about a third of official reports were made through the restricted method, indicates the lack of trust and confidence that victims have in the current system. And this is borne out in what we are told by the victims that come to us on a daily basis. Tellingly, of the victims who chose not to report, 47% indicated fear of retaliation, and over 50% said they did not think anything would be done if they reported. Of the women who did make a report, 62% of them claimed that they faced some sort of reprisals for coming forward. Reprisals can include anything from taunting and isolation within a victim's unit to adverse disciplinary actions and involuntary separations. Military sexual trauma is defined in the U.S. Code as physical assault of a sexual nature, battery of a sexual nature, or sexual harassment, which is repeated, unsolicited, verbal, or physical contact of a sexual nature, which is threatening in character, that occurred while a victim was serving, a veteran was serving on active duty or active duty training. 23% of women veterans screened positive for MST in 2011, according to the VHA. The VHA's national monitoring data reveals commonly associated diagnoses with, with MST, including PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, substance abuse, and physical health problems such as pain, headaches, GI and gynecological symptoms, chronic fatigue, fatigue, and many other detrimental health outcomes. What we see from the victims who come to us is that the trauma of the assault, coupled with retaliation and mishandling of these cases, leads to extremely adverse impacts on the lives of military women and veterans as they try to pick up the pieces of their lives. In addition to the psychological and health impacts, both the assault and the subsequent betrayal by commanders can have severely negative impacts on a victim's ability to transition into a new career or educational path outside of military service. This is compounded not only by ongoing mental health struggles, but by the black mark on their record if they were prematurely separated from the service, incurred disciplinary actions, or were given a dishonorable discharge. And this is not happening in a vacuum. Victims must often deal simultaneously with the trauma of their assault, the various military processes for investigating and potentially, although rarely punishing the perpetrator, their own professional evaluations, and everything else going in, on in their personal lives. If they are pushed out through administrative separation, or through retaliatory diagnoses, such as a personality disorder, they have to navigate the world outside the military while also attempting to get their records corrected, often doing all of this while being denied access to benefits and trying to navigate the bureaucracy of the, vet of the VA, and while often struggling with homelessness and other immediate barriers that they may be facing financially. In a moment, Rachel will walk you through the military justice system and discuss some of the possible avenues victims have for redress, including their serious limitations. But it's also important to note that while we're focusing here on the impact of the system on vic victims and survivors, this dysfunction is also detrimental to the military. When you have units that turn on victims, it erodes trust and forces people to take sides. This impacts unit cohesion and mission readiness and jeopardizes the integrity and the morale of our troops. 
Um, I just want to give you a little background on Protect Our Defenders. Protect Our Defenders is the only national organization dedicated solely to ending the epidemic of harassment and sexual assault in the United States military, preventing retaliation against victims, and ensuring justice and support for survivors. We take a comprehensive approach to tackling the complex and interwoven challenges of policy, process, and culture that create an environment in which violence is commonplace and that punishes those who speak out. Our work with victims and survivors of these crimes has informed our educational campaigns and has shaped our policy focus. It is by speaking to survivors who have experienced the broken system firsthand that we are able to identify the breakdown in the structure uh, of the military system, and it is by elevating the voices of those survivors that we have successfully been able to draw attention to the immediacy of these problems and to affect change to the status quo. Survivors are an integral part of Protect Our Defenders. Many of the most active members of the survivor community have participated on our advocacy committee. And through this committee, we have helped prepare survivors to testify before both houses of Congress, to meet private, privately with their own members of Congress to tell their stories and voice their concerns, to participate in media, and to educate members of the military and members of their own communities. One of our most effective tools has also been through media exposure. We have brought several high profile cases, including cases at Lackland Air Force Base with training instructors assaulting trainees, uh, Aviano Air Base, where a commander overturned a jury conviction of, of aggravated sexual assault, and the Naval Academy case, where a young midshipman recently endured severe mistreatment after accusing three Naval football players of assaulting her while she was incapacitated. This is just to name a few of the recent cases we've been working on. Um, all of these cases have served both to raise public awareness, but also to instigate change here in DC, where lawmakers have been increasingly skeptical of the military's ability to handle these cases on their own. Some of the programs that we engage in at Protect Our Defenders uh, include um, movement building. So we work with the survivor community um, to speak as one voice, to empower each other, and to educate the public. Um, we also provide one-on-one -on -one legal assistance by connecting victims with civilian and military uh, legal help. Uh, we've participated in impact litigation. We collaborate with attorney Susan Burke on a series of federal lawsuits seeking to drive change um, in access to civil remedies, which uh, Rachel will speak more about. And these cases were actually featured in the uh, Oscar-nominated documentary, The Invisible War. We also have survivor services online. We have a database where survivors who come to us could go to find services in their own areas to find out who their representative is. And we also do peer support connecting survivors uh, with one another for emotional support um, and to, to, to show that you know, the survivors who have come out on the other side to help survivors who are currently going through the process to, to know that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And all of this really contributes to our education and awareness campaigns. Um, everything that we learn through our programs and through working with the victims and survivors of this crime really um, drive our messaging and our focus going forward. Um, a little bit about the Pro Bono Legal Network. Um, our Pro Bono Legal Network includes a network of lawyers and caseworkers willing to assist military rape and sexual assault survivors at no cost with claims arising from being raped or sexually assaulted while on active duty, including claims relating to various forms of retaliation for coming forward. Victims come to the network with a variety of needs, including ongoing sexual assault investigations and judicial proceedings, retaliation from the military, discharge upgrades, and records corrections. Um, in addition, um, they ask for help filing uh, equal opportunity complaints, IG complaints for reprisals, and filing FOIA requests. <clears throat> Oftentimes, we, what we have found is that the individuals who are coming to us through the network are in desperate need of someone who can help them advocate on their, their own behalf or advocate for them as they struggle to navigate all of the various systems within the military um, and deal, deal with the trauma that they've incurred. Uh, so we've established an online intake process which is followed by an interview to establish each person's individual need and to assess whether their case requires legal assistance. If it does, we put together a case summary and timeline and we send their case out to our network of attorneys. 
In other cases, particularly with VA claims, we refer those cases to other organizations and clinics that we partner with. If someone needs help uh, simply accessing the files from their court martial or their discharge paperwork, or they want help writing a letter to their Congress member asking for assistance, we often do that in-house with our staff and help ensure that their requests are actually received and adequately processed. Um, through this network and through all of our work with victims and survivors, what we've witnessed is a common thread of ongoing failings of current military justice system, the remedies and systems in place to deal with this crime, and also the impact, the true impact on the lives of those who experience these crimes. And what we see across the board is that victims are, fail are falling through the cracks and are facing insurmountable obstacles to justice and to security. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Rachel Nadelson to discuss some of those, those systems in more detail. Rachel? Sorry, some technical problems there. Um, so I don't. I, I guess nobody has heard me until now. Um, but uh, thank you, Miranda, and thanks to everyone for joining the webinar. Um, and I was saying while on mute um, before that, I my understanding is that um, the the audience for the webinar represents people from a variety of different disciplines, um, some of whom might have a background in legal issues, some of whom might um, have a background in providing services to crime victims, um, some of whom might have backgrounds in mental health issues and so forth. So I apologize if any of um, the information I'm providing is redundant in any way, but um, I'm assuming that for some people it will be uh, new information, I'm just going to proceed. Um, so as Miranda was saying, a lot, more or less all of the issues that come to our attention through the, um, through the pro bono network um, are, are not really in issues that occur in isolation. So this, in spite of the fact that we might be assisting individual clients um, one at a time with, the, with those issues, taken collectively they represent larger patterns of misjustice and point to sort of structural issues and needs for um, for systemic reform. So I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of the larger picture behind um, some of the individual matters that come to our attention. Um, to start, we, um, we often hear from people, as Miranda said, who are in some way involved in the military criminal justice system. So Either they're, um, they're involved in the system because they're a crime victim and you know, they opted to invoke the criminal process, or maybe because as a result of, um, of, of making the report, they become um, the target of an investigation or are charged with some kind of collateral misconduct. Um, and usually this t the type of collateral misconduct that we find uh, victims are charged with involves offenses that outside of the military wouldn't either wouldn't be regarded as crimes or wouldn't be um, offenses that would really be very robustly prosecuted, like underage drinking, um, maybe you know possession of prescription drugs with um, unauthorized, that sort of thing. Adultery, obviously, is one that doesn't exist outside of the military within criminal context. Um, but the, uh, the, the, the problem, and I'm sure that many people have, um, you know, have encountered this in the media lately, is that the system is one in which um, instead of a, a dispassionate and impartial 
third party who is legally trained uh, making decisions about whether or not to, um, to bring criminal charges within the context of a court martial. The person who makes that decision is somebody who has a pre-existing relationship with uh, with both with usually both parties, so both the victim and the alleged perpetrator. Um, and as a result, this leads to a certain amount of bias, um, sometimes against sometimes in favor of the perpetrator if they're if it's a well liked person and there's a good relationship between the the commander and the perpetrator. Um, the flip side of that is sometimes um, there are un, you know, charges that aren't meritorious that are brought forward because there isn't a good relationship. Um, and this discretion or authority that the commanders have over um, sort of invoking the criminal justice process also extends to issuing and enforcing military protective orders. So within the military, um, a violating a military protective order is considered a failure to obey a direct and lawful, and lawful order. And as such, um, it can be enforced by only by commanders. Um, so I won't go into this in great detail, but for, for practical purposes, um, because military protective orders are limited in their scope and sometimes limited in um, the, the degree of partiality with which or impartiality with which they're awarded, um, it's often useful to uh, to obtain civilian protective orders as well as military protective orders. And since I've already um, discussed retaliation and collateral misconduct, I'm going to go ahead and ask Miranda to, um, to go to the next slide. Oh, thanks. Um, so moving on to civil remedies, um, I personally don't have uh, I'm not, a, I've never practiced criminal law. My background is in um, civil rights issues. So my perspective, certainly, and you know, I, I hope other people's perspective of, um, or when it comes to addressing these sort of injustices um, inherent in the commander-driven system of justice, it takes into account not only the fact that the criminal justice system often um, lets victims down, um, but also that there really isn't any remedy available to crime victims in the military outside of um, a criminal process. Um, so out, for, for people who experience crimes in the workplace outside of the military, if, as often happens, especially with sex crimes, they find that you know, they, the perpetrator isn't brought to justice, they can then bring civil claims either against the, um, their employer um, or against the perpetrator himself or herself. Um, the, the big distinction between not military and non-military employees is that uh, in the military there are no civil claims available to, um, to per, uh, military personnel who have um, who have experienced, who have suffered injuries. Um, so, and and I should I should also specify that this is only the case with respect to uniformed personnel. So, Department of Defense contractors and civilian Department of Defense employees can bring either negligence or discrimination claims against the military as an institution. Um, but uh, there's sort of significant legal precedent that bars military employees from bringing civil claims against the military for either for failing to protect them or for discriminating against them based on based on their sex. So I think we can move on. Um, so the, because of the lack of these external remedies, what what military personnel have available to them are a series of internal remedies. Um, the first of which being uh, equal opportunity complaints. So every base has an equal opportunity office um, to handle these complaints, um, and 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 indeed, if uh, you know, for for people who experience either discrimination or sexual harassment, um, which you know, is considered under the law a form of sex discrimination, um, there is nominally a process um, through which to present a grievance. Um, the problem is that um, you know these are the EO office is not meant to advocate for victims of discrimination. It's just meant to be an investigative office, and often those investigations aren't really conducted impartially. Um, com since complaints are processed through the chain of command, there's a lot of potential for people who file those complaints to experience retaliation. 
Um, and at that point, at that point, we can. You know, um, I'm sorry. That there are other remedies available to for people who want to present grievances based on the act of retaliation itself. So, Miranda, I think maybe we can move on. Oh, thank you. Um, so, in instances of retaliation, um, if somebody has exercised their right to make what's called a protected communication, and that includes filing filing a complaint um, alleging some form of discrimination, either harassment or discriminate um, or, or some other form of um, uh, inappropriate discrimination, uh, they they're able to file a complaint with um, the Office of the Inspector General, which uh, ordinarily tasked with investigating instances of fraud, waste, and abuse. Um, again, this isn't, you know, this is a, um, a resource that exists on paper, but for practical purposes, we've found that it really doesn't deliver much in the way of relief. Um, there's a lot of discretion built into whether the IG actually has to fully investigate allegations. So after doing an initial um, assessment as to whether the allegations um, merit further review, then they either uh, the IG can either opt to investigate fully or decide that it you know that that the allegations don't actually merit a full um, a, a full investigation being conducted. And according to the Government Accountability Office, um, only 29 percent of reprisal complaints um, in a given period of time, a five-year period of time, um, were, were fully investigated. And of those um, that were fully investigated, only a quarter were substantiated, which means that only a quarter of those um, could be potentially used as the basis for a request for a remedy from the Board, um, uh, the board of Correction, uh, excuse me, um, the Board of Correction of Military Records. So I think maybe ready to move on. Yeah. Um, so if indeed um, you, for people who fall into to that small percentile of of, uh, of complainants uh, who uh, who were, who at, whose allegations led to a full investigation and were ultimately substantiated, um, they can then petition their branch board for the correction of military records for some type of remedy. Um, and again, in theory, um, th there's a process for this. They're entitled to you know, a, a prompt investigation, a copy of the IG's report, um, notification of this right existing that they can you know, the right to petition the board for relief but um, the the boards um, uh, for general purposes are don't award relief at very high rates so it's the likelihood is, is very much that it's ver the odds are very much against um, a complainant actually being able to obtain um, some sort of relief like reinstatement in their former position. And I should also specify that um, unlike, say, the Equal, Op um, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the boards aren't authorized to award damages. So it, the, the, degree, the, the types of relief they can award complainants are fairly limited at the outset. And let's see, don't know if... Miranda, okay, so now Miranda is going to, with that being said, Miranda is going to talk a little bit more about um, Protect Our Defenders goals for kind of addressing these issues. Thank you, Rachel. So, um, so now that you have a little bit of a background on the scope of the problem within the military as well as the structure of the current justice system and really the barriers that survivors face in trying to seek any sort of redress or get anyone um, to listen to them, um, I think it, it, it really gives you a picture of why uh, advocates feel that reform is so necessary and so um, needed so immediately. Uh, I'm going to go over some of our policy priorities and, um, and review some of the then we'll review some of the reforms that have been passed more recently um, to, that have been addressed, addressing the problems we've highlighted, but also have left some gaps that still need to be addressed. 
So, um, so our main policy priorities, number one, as, no, as Rachel had highlighted, um, the current structure with the commander really overseeing all the, um, all parts of the justice system uh, is really what we see as a, as a main impediment to reform. So removing the authority to prosecute and adjudicate these cases from biased or, or um, at least non-objective uh, commanders and giving it to professionally trained legal experts we see as an, an absolute necessity. We have also been working on Article 32 reform, that's to reform preliminary hearings, um, which are often a, a funnel where uh, victims drop out of the process because it's such an it's been historically such an arduous process just trying to even um, get your case heard and get to a court martial that most victims um, become discouraged and intimidated and and um, decline to continue with the process. We've been working on victims' legal representation, getting um, victims' attorneys to help them um, navigate the military justice process, and also hopefully to uh, to guard against some of these retaliatory actions that we see too often. And also we've been working on sentencing and clemency reform because the commander still has quite a bit of control over um, over the punishment in, if, if in that small percentage of cases where, where uh, cases are actually adjudicated, um, that doesn't necessarily mean and often doesn't mean that the perpetrator will face any sort of punishment. Um, but in addition to the legislative fixes, we really put a strong emphasis on holding leaders accountable and exposing wrongdoing within the military leadership. Uh, for decades, this problem has been swept under the rug, and while the top brass have continued to say that they have zero tolerance for sexual assault, we continue to hear these devastating cases of, of people who have tried to speak out and, and have been thwarted. But there have been a lot of brave men and women from Paula Coughlin at the Pale Hook scandal back in the 90s to some of these more recent cases with the Naval Academy and Aviana where, where people have been speaking out and exposing the wrongdoing within their own ranks. And we've really been able to shine a spotlight on what was formerly a really closed and insular institution. And we really believe that transparency and objectivity is the key to bringing about real change in the, in the culture within the military. So just to, just to talk a little bit more about fundamental reform, because this is something that's really been in, in the news a lot lately, and it's been really hotly debated and very much opposed by the military um, establishment. But, um, but we believe you know, that right now we have a system where commanders are, um, they're at the head of, of every sexual assault prosecution. So if a victim wants to come forward, the same person who's going to be responsible for her his or her uh, professional and career advancement um, is also going to be the person who's ultimately reviewing everything that happened in her case and, and making a decision about credibility and guilt and innocence and whether or not that case, mer that case merits uh, prosecution. And we think that this creates a system where people don't want to come forward, they don't believe anything will be done, and, and at the end of the day, when their cases aren't prosecuted, it creates an environment where they feel that their commander doesn't believe them, doesn't support them, and it, it, it creates a disincentive for victims to come forward and therefore inhibits the ability to actually prosecute these cases and to, and to, get, to get any sort of um, progress in terms of eliminating these assailants from the ranks. And at the end of the day, this is really what we see as a matter of fairness, basically American values and this idea of blind justice and, and objectivity and fairness is really lacking from the military system right now. And we have men and women who are signing up to serve our country and then being betrayed by their own system when they are hurt by someone within their own ranks. And we really believe that, that, that that's a shame and that, that that needs to be changed. So, so there have been a lot of positive reforms that have been passed, and um, the main avenue or vehicle for passing those reforms is the National Defense Authorization Act. So over the past few years, there have been um, some, some promising reforms that have been passed, although most of them have been what we consider tinkering around the edges, fixing all of the kind of tangential problems that make maybe make victims' lives easier in the short run, but don't get at the, you know, the systemic and institutional problems that are really preventing justice from being done in these cases. And I'm going to turn it over to Rachel just um, to review some of those past reforms that, we, that we've instigated. Rachel? 
Um, oh, thank you. Um, so as Miranda mentioned, the, the primary legislative vehicle for introducing changes and, um, and sort of creating protections for victims of sexual assault over the past few years has been the National Defense Authorization Act. Um, and the most recent one is for um, the coming fiscal year. And although it's primarily an authorization bill, it also includes substantive um, substantive uh, provisions of reform. So probably the ones that have gotten the most attention this time around are um, that uh, uh, unlike, uh, excuse me, <laughs> as, as Miranda mentioned before, with respect to um, commanders being able to, um, to make decisions um, at the post-trial level, uh, they're not, there are now limitations that have been placed on um, on a commander's ability to overturn uh, what amounts to a jury verdict. So that probably is the you know provision that one of the provisions that have gotten the most attention. Um, in addition to that, there's been some reforms made um, with respect to the article, what's called the Article 32 process, um, and which is a preliminary hearing um, that outside of the military is just used um, in order in order to determine whether there is some um, probable cause for, um, for for proceeding with prosecution. Um, in the military traditionally at least critics have found that it's used much more expansively um, as a discovery tool for um, for the defense um, and there have been instances in which uh, victims have been um, have been subject subjected to very uncomfortable and sometimes humiliating questions um, that really, even at a trial level, would, would be objectionable, but certainly within the context of what's supposed to be a limited um, preliminary hearing, uh, critics have found to be inappropriate. So that, too, um, has become uh, the, the, uh, the object of some, of some reform. Um, so apart from those, you know, those um, two reforms that probably have gotten the most public attention. There are a number of other reforms that the NDAA has introduced that have gotten probably less public attention but are worthy of additional scrutiny. Um, one of which has to do, and I'll, I'll, I won't go into great detail, but has to do with what's called transitional compensation um, for family members of offenders. So within the context of domestic violence, for example, um, in order not to punish the victim, there, um, there, there are mechanisms in the military for the, um, the abused partner or the children of the abused partner um, to be able to retain certain benefits, um, even, even though the perpetrator or the abusive spouse who, you know, who is the um, service member is being stripped of those benefits as a result of their conduct. So um, there's the, the 2014 Act, National Defense Authorization Act has um, has required the Secretary of Defense to conduct a study uh, um, as concerning the merits and feasibility of applying um, that model to uh, uh, spouses and dependents of service members who are um, convicted of sex crimes and, and, and not simply intimate partner violence. Um, and then additionally, there's a provision um, that, would, uh, that, that would incorporate uh, the terms of the Federal Crime Victims' Rights Act into um, Title X, which is the statute that governs military justice. So right now, the Department of Defense has, has internal policies concerning the rights of crime victims. Um, primarily concerning privacy um, and right to have counsel present and so forth, but these um, these rights were not have not been codified formally into statute. So um, one of the terms of the of the most recent National Defense Authorization Act is that they now will be. And then very briefly, um, in past iterations in the National Defense Authorization Act in 2012 and 2013 have also brought some pretty significant changes, um, mostly to do with retention of records. Um, and 
historically, um, there's been there have been difficulties for, and we'll talk a little bit in greater detail about this um, later on in the presentation. But um, historically, it's been diff difficult for uh, veterans who are seeking disability compensation from the VA to um, to present documentation of the stressor leading to whatever psychological injuries they're um, they're asserting to, in, in order to get compensation, um, and in order to address the problem of this difficulty in accessing um, primary records of either reports or forensic um, forensic evidence, there have been recently um, for the past two or three years, uh, changes made that require uh, that both uh, unrestricted reports of sexual assault and restricted reports of sexual assault be kept on file for 50 years, um, as opposed to uh, you know, a matter of five years or under, which was the, um, the initial standard. And then uh, one more um, sort of useful or meaningful provision um, that comes to mind is um, a process that was devised in order to allow uh, victims who are in are in a position where they've made a report and are still are either experiencing retaliation as a result of having done so or are still serving in the same unit as their perpetrator um, a, a vehicle to provide for an expedited transfer to another unit so that they can um, you know serve without having continue to serve without having um, concerns for their safety. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so while the NDAA has really been an ideal, ideal vehicle for many of our reforms, there are, there are some other areas where um, we've had to use a different approach. And this really comes into play with victims' rights in military courts and protection of victims' privacy rights. Uh, it often requires us to basically push on both sides, both pushing for statutory reform and also trying to ensure that the laws are being interpreted and applied adequately within the military courts, which um, in, in a lot of cases are, are not particularly sympathetic to victims. So last year, Protector Defenders filed an amicus brief in a case that led to the highest military court um, ruling that victims do have standing to be heard in court, which was a big step towards protecting victims. Um, but um, we're still trying to push for congressionally mandated um, changes that would enshrine those rights, um, statutorily mandate that, that victims could uh, have access and are entitled to full representation um, through this new victims count, special victims council program, which is a program that was recently established by the military and mandated by Congress that will uh, provide victims with attorneys um, during trial. Um, unfortunately, what we've continued to see are efforts to erode the military's rape shield rule to basically put the burden on victims to show why their prior sexual history and, um, and any actions related to that shouldn't be um, shouldn't be admitted into court instead of having the putting the burden on defense to show why it's needed. And also, we are working on several cases right now where the judge is basically unilaterally ignoring a victim psychotherapy patient privilege um, and basically subpoenaing um, notes and confidential records of communications between victims and their therapists. And in one case, even actually subpoenaing a therapist um, to testify at um, before the judge on communications and conversations she had with a victim. So this is really troubling. We've been working um, really hard to support victims' counsel as they challenge these rulings in court and to, um, to try and, and file amicus briefs and to get this up to the higher courts. But we've also been trying to outreach, do outreach with the executive branch who actually write and, and promulgate these evidentiary rules in an effort to eventually update them so that they cannot be misinterpreted or abused by, the, by military judges. And this is really especially of concern, I think, to the mental health community. I mean, we're speaking with, with therapists and with mental health providers who you know, aren't, are realizing that they can't necessarily, they're not able to, um, to ensure or to promise the, the confidentiality that, that this victim is entitled to because the judges are threatening, you know, they're subpoenaing the, the therapists and, and forcing them to, to, to reveal inf personal information. And um, that really that really sums up kind of the policy landscape. Although we're constantly you know, we're constantly responding and reacting to new new issues and gaps as they arise. And um, I know we're running short on time. I'd like to have time for questions. And we but we've spent a lot of time today focusing on 
on the current system and the impacts to those who are serving, but we recognize that this really translates into a major implications for the veteran community. And with that, I'd just like to turn it over to Rachel one last time, just really briefly to run through um, you know, a little bit uh, on that side of the equation, and, and then we'll wrap it up, and, and we'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Okay, so I will try to be <laughs> extremely brief at this point, but, and I already mentioned before that, um, and many of you might already know, uh, based on your last webinar, that in order to be eligible for disability compensation, claimants have to prove that they have a disability, that they served in the military, and that there's a direct connection between the two. And they ordinarily have to prove this um, by sort of extensive documentary evidence. Um, with cases of PTSD that result from either combat or um, sort of deployment-related stressors, there's now a, a presumption that if somebody um, served in the military and uh, has, you know, has been diagnosed with, um, you know, with a particular condition um, that's consistent with uh, stressors that might exist while serving in the military, there's a presumption that those two are connected and it's not, the burden is not on the claimant to, to prove through documentary evidence that there's a connection between the two. Unfortunately, that presumption does, a service connection doesn't apply to uh, veterans who have psychological conditions like PTSD that result from sexual trauma. So as a result of that, there's a great need to provide um, written documentation attesting to the fact that, um, your, that, that the disability in question stems from a stressor experience while serving in the military. And because there's so much underreporting when it comes to sex crimes in the military, it's historically been very hard for claimants um, who, you know, whose stressors, military sexual trauma, to be able to access those benefits. Um, and the changes that I mentioned that came about through the most recent NDAA were, were really meant to address this by um, requiring the military to retain records, not only um, not only unrestricted records, not only records of unrestricted reports, but also um, records of restricted reports for 50 years. Um, as opposed to uh, you know, a much more limited period of time. And the most recent NDAA actually extended that 50-year standard to restricted um, report records as well. So hopefully that will um, go a little way towards making it easier for people who are applying for disability compensation to make those cases. And I don't know if we're so this is effectively what, <laughs> what I was just speaking about. But in order, you know, in, in order to, um, you know, to to go ahead and make that um, or establish that nexus between um, disability and time in the military, there are various um, there are various records that the VA will accept, um, and they don't have to be, uh, you know, um, the actual report that uh, that they that the person filed. Uh, alleging sexual the, the in, uh, instance of sexual assault, they can be secondary um, sources like um, statements from rape crisis centers, statements from mental health providers, um, statements from family and friends, and so forth. Um, and the the VA is also encouraged um, to you know to, to take into account certain behavioral cues of that that point to trauma like a request for a transfer, a deterioration of work performance, um, problems with substance abuse, et cetera. So in theory, there, it's meant to be a more relaxed standard, but it still does require submitting a good deal of documentary evidence. OK, so and then finally, um, I'm, I'll just make the brief point that because there are have historically been these barriers to accessing disability compensation for uh, for, for veterans who, uh, who who have PTSD linked to sexual trauma, um, and and because for so many veterans VA disability compensation is you know a, a pretty big source of income support, um, people you know veterans who aren't able to access disability compensation. Are, are, you know, are much more likely to experience homelessness. And in fact, um, there have been studies done that indicate that 40% of homeless female veterans report having experienced sexual assault in the military. So there's a strong link between 
um, between sexual assault while serving and um, uh, subsequent homelessness, um, both because you know, sex, sexual assault is obviously traumatic and destabilizing, and also because um, the, uh, the nature of underreporting and the requirements that um, that are built into uh, the VA disability compensation system um, you know, make it hard for, um, for for veterans in that position to ultimately be awarded disability compensation. So I think that is where I'm going to end. Thanks, Rachel, and um, thank you all for, for participating in this webinar today and for listening to us. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And also, I would just like to say that you know, we would like to serve as a resource. We, like to, we partner with organizations that work on these issues and work with, with veterans and active duty service members. So feel free to reach out to me, to our organization, um, anytime if you have additional questions or issues you're facing in your own practice. Thank you. Hello, thank you all. Um, thank you, Miranda and Rachel, for your presentation. I think that you guys provided some very useful information um, for all of the organizations and the advocates on the line. We've got a couple of questions. Um, the first one says, um, do the presenters see any survivors of MST receiving bad paper upon discharge linked to behavior stemming from the trauma like we see with combat-related PTSD and in situations like DUIs? Mm. Yes. I, I would say about, um, about a third of the cases that we receive through our pro bono network involve um, either issues where, you know, there was behavioral, um, behavioral um, you know, not problems is the wrong word, but, you know, there were the behavioral changes after the assault and as a result of the trauma, either substance abuse or just not showing up to work on time or having other problems where commanders were not um, effectively communicating or understanding the situation, um, putting a lot of pressure on, on survivors to, to perform at the same level as they were before. And often we see this translating into diagnoses of either adjustment or personality disorders, um, and that's basically a disqualifying condition. So instead of being allowed time to recover and heal, what we see a lot of time is people who are being disqualified from service with a non-service connected disorder on their on their discharge paperwork, essentially leaving the military and having to try and fight these discharges. So we've been working to, um, and, and that's in addition to other types of collateral misconduct, um, but we're hoping that the Special Victims Council, these attorneys that are supposed to represent the victims can hopefully try to um, prevent some of these from occurring by communicating with the command, educating them about um, about common behavioral changes and, 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 um, and issues that survivors are working through. Uh, but it is a very common problem, and it's something that's very troubling that we see far too often. Um, thank you, Miranda. Thank you so much. Um, we've got another question. Is there any effort to make the Veterans Benefit Administration better at service-connected um, ratings for PTSD when it's MST? Um, well, there was legislation that was introduced last year ultimately it didn't go anywhere but it was um, it was called the Ruth Moore Act and it would have um, it would have extended that presumption of service connection that applies in other instances of, of PTSD to instances of PTSD that um, stem from sexual trauma so the, there have been efforts and you know I, I think there are certainly legislators who are interested in pursuing the issue forward um, but under the status quo, you know, there still is this obligation to um, to go ahead and make, and, um, make that connection between um, the time in the military and, and the disability in question. Yeah, I would just say that um, I believe Senator Bernie Sanders has been considering this in the Senate and has shown a concern and interest for the for this legislation going forward. Okay, thank you. Um, and do you think that there will be a 
more initiative put into it and maybe reintroduce um, the Ruth Moore Act? Yes, definitely. And Ruth Moore, the survivor who the, the bill is named after, is also active in advocating for this bill. And um, it's definitely on the, on the list of legislative priorities. We, we, um, it's not on, I, I guess we didn't include it in our focus because we tend to not be as much on the veterans um, side in terms of veteran services, but we certainly support it and think that it's necessary considering everything that, that we're seeing in the, in the broken system and the amount of people who are leaving with PTSD and MST. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we've got another question, and this was uh, another question related to the previous comment where we were talking about um, receiving bad paper. Can you expand your discussion a little bit to um, address consequences of bad paper when it's related to um, PTSD and uh, how complicated that situation can be when it's derived from sexual assault? Yes, I mean, I, I think we could both speak to that. I mean, it's devastating for a lot of these survivors. You're, you know, you're dealing with trauma, you're trying to recover, um, and you're facing what, you, what is perceived and is, in fact, often a hostile environment where instead of receiving support, you are basically being told that there's something wrong with you, and there's something wrong with the way that you are um, responding to a trauma. And then in addition to that, it has practical implications for you if you leave the military with bad paper and you have trouble getting um, benefits or getting disability or getting your GI bill, depending on you know, the, the scope of the, bad, of the paperwork and depending on what type of discharge you get. And in addition, you know, if you get diagnosed with a personality disorder, wrongly diagnosed instead of PTSD or adjustment disorder, and that follows you in every job and every other type of um, you know, decision about your life that you try to make, that's always going to be there. It's going to be something that you're going to have to explain. And for anyone leaving with that, that's hard. But for someone when it's connected to your sexual assault, you know, how, being constantly reminded of that and, and looking as if something you did was wrong, I think is, is extremely devastating. So both emotionally and, and practically, it has severe repercussions. And like Rachel said, with the lack of remedies and the lack of options for, for ch pursuing um, justice to, to, to correct those records, it's a very daunting task for someone who is suffering from trauma, trying to get benefits, trying to adjust to leaving the military, um, and now you have to additionally try to advocate for yourself and for, to try and, and change those records, it's, it's, it's overwhelming and often impossible. So that is one thing we're trying to address in our pro bono legal network. And we you know, luckily have a lot of civilian attorneys who have been offering their services to try to help. But if you don't have an attorney, it's, it's very difficult. And then Rachel, I don't, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that. Um, I mean, I really don't have that much to add other than that, you know, for, for practical purposes, it's, it, it's very much an uphill battle if you don't have an honorable discharge to access disability compensation from the VA and address, the, you know, the, the act of rectifying that by either um, applying for a discharge upgrade or trying to get your records corrected is, you know, is, is extremely difficult and, and rates of relief when it comes to, um, to, to to those petitions are really, really low. Um, the only thing I'll say is that it, even more than within the arena of applying for disability compensation, when it comes to um, applying for a discharge upgrade, it makes a huge difference to have legal representation. All right, thank you both for your responses. I think that um, that's very helpful. We do have a couple other questions. <clears throat> Um, and this is coming from another organization that is offering direct services. It says, we find that it is difficult to secure housing for many women who have MST, especially since there seems to be a lack of women-specific housing and safe housing. Do you have any specific comments or resources on this? I would say actually that sorts of plowshares, <laughs> our whole organization would be in a better position to speak to that. Um, because they do extensive um, work not only to do with you know the needs of women veterans broadly but to do with housing needs specifically I mean the only thing that I can speak to having a little bit of a background in homelessness as opposed to permanent housing 
sort of the, the politics around that issue is that it, within when it comes to access to shelter for women veterans with children, uh, there are certain structural limitations um, that built into the to the VA grant making process that make it you know that that create a disincentive for um, for providers to agree to accept women with children um, because they're you know under the status quo they're they're only compensated for um, for the services that they provide to the veteran and not to the um, to the veteran's dependents. Great, thank you so much. Um, we've got another question. What happens when a victim files a restricted report? What are their rights? Well, the purpose of restricted reporting is so that um, somebody who, for whatever reason, doesn't want to invoke the criminal justice process, either they fear retaliation or you know, it's obviously very emotionally taxing to, to go through the criminal justice system. Um, and, but, but they have certain needs that they'd like to be met, um, like counseling needs or met, you know, a need for medical assistance. So by, by virtue of um, filling out a restrictive report, you become entitled to those services and, and with the understanding that uh, your, your actual report will remain confidential. And so that in itself is a right. <laughs> Oh, I'll just add, though, you can convert a restricted report into an unrestricted report. So you could make a restricted report and get a SANE exam, um, but decide not to um, pursue, you know, just not to pursue an investigation, not have anyone notified at the time. Um, and later you could convert, you could decide to make an unrestricted report, convert it, and then they, that would trigger an investigation. And sometimes what we see is problems where um, the victim does not want to trigger an unrestricted report, but because of the ways in which a report goes unrestricted, if they tell a friend um, and that friend tells a commander, if if they tell a coworker, if they confide in the wrong person, it could automatically trigger an unrestricted report um, where an investigation would start and their command would be notified regardless of whether they, that was wanted. So there, um, it was designed to protect victims who didn't want to participate in the process, but it, it's certainly not flawless. There, there, there's a lot of um, ways in which it can it can ultimately um, still not work in the victim's best interest. <clears throat> All right, thank you, uh, Rachel Miranda, for your for answering the very um, timely questions, uh, and thank you, the audience, for presenting your questions to um, the presenters. At this time, if there aren't any additional questions relevant to the first part of the presentation. Um, we are going to move on to the second half, and uh, at this time, please welcome Elizabeth Stenson. All right, so we've actually been having some technical difficulties. Um, so at this time, we're going to go ahead and move on um, and focus any of the questions that anyone attending the webinar might have in regards to the wellness grant or um, any additional questions relevant to these presentations. All right, um, thank you so much for the informative presentations and the interactive question and answers. This concludes today's presentation and discussion. We'd like to thank our presenters Miranda Peterson and Rachel Nadelson. We'd especially like to thank you, our participants. Please note that each of you will receive an email with the web link to evaluate this presentation. Your feedback is important to us and it is greatly appreciated. Thank you again for your time. This concludes our webinar. You may now disconnect. <laughs>